I graduated from Hampton University with my bachelor's degree, and after that, I spent a lot of years in the emergency department in various psychiatric settings. In 2008, I began at NIH, and I worked on the inpatient unit, supporting children with mood disorders and psychosis through research. During that time, I graduated with my master's from the University of Maryland, Baltimore, and I became a certified registered nurse practitioner. In 2015, I began working with the Developmental Neurogenomics Unit at NIH, and currently I conduct physical exams, nursing assessments, and structured psychiatric assessments, which I'll get into a little bit more detail later. later. I've seen various aneuploidy groups through a biopsy study we conducted um, and we finished actually last year, but the main focus of our protocol over the past two years has been boys with XYY syndrome. So please feel, feel free to ask me any questions, and Dr. Rosnahan, the principal investigator of the protocol, is also here um, and help, will help answer any questions as well. Throughout today's presentation, I hope to discuss the profile of health issues present in a large-scale clinical sample of individuals with XYY syndrome discuss a range of presentations seen in these youth, and also discuss priorities for future research on the profile of developmental and mental issues in individuals with XYY syndrome. So just, I know many of you guys are familiar, but I'd just like to cover briefly the typical chromosomal makeup. So typically there's 22 pairs of chromosomes plus one pair of sex chromosomes. And in males with XYY, they have an extra Y chromosome down there on the bottom, as you can see highlighted with the green circle. Boys and girls with extra Xs would have two Xs on the X chromosome there. And 47 XYY is considered a random event. Usually it's not inherited. It's an error during meiosis. There are other forms of aneuploidy, which are called monosomy, such as XO, which is Turner syndrome, where there's only one chromosome on the sex chromosome axis there or tetrasomies such as XXXX or XXXY. XXXY, yes. <laughs> Aneuploidy groups are diagnosed through genetic testing. These are, can be, do, be done prenatally. Usually it's done during chorionic villus sampling, which is the removal of placental tissue. This is usually done between 10 and 12 weeks. It's the preferred technique to do prior to 15 t weeks gestation or you can have it done during um, an amniocentesis, which is usually done around 16 weeks. And this is when you are, have a test of the amniotic fluid. So both of these procedures are considered invasive and usually reserved for high-risk pregnancies, such as women with advanced maternal age, which is 35 or above, or any genetic abnormalities or anything that's seen possibly um, during any of the sonograms. More recently, there is a non-invasive prenatal screening test, or NIPT testing, or screening, as we were told earlier today. And this is where the maternal blood is used for sampling to screen for common, common aneuploidies. And so with this, hopefully, a lot more aneuploidies will be diagnosed because women during pregnancy frequently have blood draws. So this will help um, diagnose many more aneuploidy groups. People with aneuploidies can have the mosaic or non-mosaic form. Mo mosaic aneuploidies do not have the extra chromosome in each cell. So some cells will have as it looks there, and then some will have it just with one Y. In our study, we enroll boys with an extra Y chromosome in every cell, which is referred to as non-mosaic. We use a lab that analyzes the cells to rule out a 6% mosaicism, and we do this to have the most focused group of boys with XYY syndrome. When you have fewer cells with XYY, you have a potential for more variability, so we'll try to rule that out. XYY occurs in about 1 in 1,000 newborn males. It's referred to as XYY, 47, 47 XYY, YY syndrome, or Jacob syndrome. Um, characteristics are often subtle in these boys, and it's believed that many of them are undiagnosed. But we're hoping that with the increased amount of fetuses being tested for um, prenatal during the prenatal period, we'll have more children that have the diagnosis and we can continue to research more. So some of the first reports. In 1959, the first case of XYY was identified. And during the 60s and 70s, there was an increase in studies showing an increased rate of men in prison with XYY. And a lot of these studies spoke a lot about criminality. And even today, if you look up some of the XYY, you get a lot of information about aggression and, and even in the media today. But the studies were then 
since debunked because once they found that they went, went back and adjusted for socioeconomic status and other factors, that the rates of men with XYY were no higher than those of the controls. Most of these studies have an ascertainment bias because they already focused on men who were in the prison system or institutionalized and that <coughs> already had psych psychiatric or behavioral problems. Patricia Jacobs conducted a study in 1965 and examined males with XYY syndrome, and this is where a lot of that criminality um, started to come. But in 1976, Witten et al. did a non-biased study, and they found that criminality, it was published, Criminality in Men with XYY and XXY Syndrome. He stated that a lot of the crimes that the men were in jail for were not actually aggressive in nature, and he actually attributed that the higher rates was due to a possible lower IQ, and that these men were easily led into situations that were not ideal or were more likely to be apprehended if they were in trouble. Key findings since those earlier reports. So we have birth cohorts. We have a low ascertainment bias. We've talked a lot about that. I've heard that a lot today. And that basically means that we're not finding these boys after they've already had problems. So they were diagnosed prenatally. And you can see here the differences in the verbal IQ and the performance IQ. And verbal IQ is speaking and performance is more of the puzzle kind of um, IQ stuff. There's three different studies here and each row is a study. The dot and the lines are an estimate and the shift of the XYY group compared to XY males. So that, that line is the XY males. So as you can see, there's usually about a 15 point reduction in verbal IQ and about a 10 point reduction in, in performance IQ in these boys. They're also attributed with some motor and language difficulties and some temper tantrums. Clinical samples, most of these are postnatally diagnosed. You can see in the, or non-birth cohorts, they have more ascertainment bias, but they often have more individuals and, more, and these have more measures as well. So a lot of these boys have raised rates of motor and language difficulties, ADHD and other externalizing disorders such as oppositional defiant disorder, and difficulty, difficulties in social interaction and, and autism spectrum diagnosis. So there's been a lot more need for more work using a detailed psychiatric assessment combined with cognitive and brain organization. And the main goal of our study is what I'm going to be focusing on is a lot of the findings that we have received during this detailed psychiatric and um, so psychosocial assessment. So that's the NIH, that's where we work and people who have visited come into the clinical center which is that building there and that's our atrium down on the first floor and it's the largest research ded dedicated hospital in the world. We have recruited about 70 participants with XYY in our study from North America and Europe. As you can see, we've seen you know, people from all over the world. We've actually have a couple families from the United Kingdom and one in Norway. We see the male siblings if they're willing to participate and between the ages of five and 25. And we also see healthy volunteers to serve as controls. So we actually see both healthy um, females and males to serve as controls. So we, for this part of the statistics, we use 65 of the boys because we've actually seen a couple more since we've um, done this. But the average age as I, or at the mean age is about 13 years old. And again, I said that we see children between the ages of five and 25. 58% of our boys were diagnosed after birth with the mean age of about five years old of diagnosis. And these boys were usually diagnosed after birth due to concerns due to de developmental delays or behavioral issues or a combination. 75% of the boys were seen in, were in public school at the time and 57% of them had specialized services in school, such as an IEP, which allowed for extra time in school, preferential seating, or an aide to sit there with them and help them kind of get through school. Others had adaptive PE or special education classes, and not all of them had an IEP, and it's important to note that a handful of the boys in public school actually were in gifted programs. So this is a little bit about, kind of, that's the schedule there. I know it's difficult to read, but most of our participants come in for a two-day visit. We have done it over one day, but it's, it's pretty intense, especially for the little ones. Or we can spread it out over three days, just depending on what the family, family needs. But when you come into the study, we do, um, I do the height and weight and vital signs. 
I also do a case ads assessment, which I'll get into a little bit later, which is a psychiatric, structured psychiatric assessment. They are also seen by our psychologist, and they go through a very detailed autism spectrum disorder screening. They use the ADOS, which is the Autism Diagnostic Observation Schedule, and the parents are also interviewed using the ADI. And then once they um, come in, they go through a 90-minute um, MRI, which is helping us as well, and Dr. Rosenham will talk about that a little bit later. And then I do some bio compositions to see how the boys are as far as height and weight and body fat composition. We do, as I said, use um, a blood sample for karyotyping, but also if the boys are younger or fearful of needles, I'll take a DNA sample of saliva to use for research as well. So before I get into our findings, I think it's really important to emphasize a couple of things. So again, the ascertainment bias. The numbers I show relate to people who know they're diagnosed with XYY, and this may be different than the larger group of individuals, because I said there's many that don't know that they have XYY syndrome. So a lot of the children that we're seeing are coming in because if they were diagnosed postnatally, they already have had issues, and that they've already been involved with healthcare um, providers. And then we do actually do have a, a sample of prenatally diagnosed as well, so we have a little bit of both. But it's important to recognize that everybody has their own strengths and weaknesses, even within one family, that if you have five children, they're all gonna be individuals. So just because your child has XYY syndrome does not mean that he's gonna have these lists of syndromes. He might have symptoms of others, or he might have a combination of them as well. So important background for thinking about mental health is cognition and development. So the average population IQ is 100. In our sample, you can see the average is about 85, but there's still a large variation. So that box there is kind of the, well, the darker line in the middle is the average of the XYY boys that we've seen, but all those little dots up and down that line are where the boys have fit into the, the IQ testing. So we've had people who have had well above 100, and we've also had boys who had uh, under 100. So we have here walking and talking within normal limits. So a lot of the children that have come in have come in or been diagnosed postnatally due to a developmental delay. A lot of times that's due to speech. A lot of times speech after two is what we're considering a delay. And you can see there that 49% were within normal limits, but 43% were delayed. We have an NA column there, or a row there, but that's because some parents didn't remember um, the exact date, so we didn't want to unfairly put them in one of the, the samples there. Talking, we, I discussed, and walking within normal limits, most of them are walking within normal limits, which is considered about 18 months of age. And then we had a small percentage that were delayed at 15%. On the left, we have broken down the delay in talking into the prenatally diagnosed and the postnatally diagnosed group. There is a higher rate of speech within normal limits in the prenatally diagnosed sample. And on the right, you can see the correlated IQ of these groups. The mean IQ of the prenatally diagnosed group is slightly higher than the postnatally postnatally diagnosed group, but you can still see there's a wide variety of IQ scores. And again, I'm not saying that the boys who are postnatally diagnosed are going to be more severe, but a lot of times if you're prenatally diagnosed, you're already in touch with services, which can help with the um, speech therapy and, and kind of understanding and getting in touch with services in the community. So the case ads assessment, it's the schedule for affective disorders and schizophrenia for school-aged children, and that's what I use to go through the psychiatric assessment. It's an assessment that I complete with both the parent or guardian and the child, and of course some of these children are very young, so it's hard to really go through the tool with them, so a lot of times I'll, I'll go on with the parent report for that. But it talks about current and past diagnoses. It starts with a history consisting of prenatal questioning, questions, medical history, developmental history, and educational history. Since we see boys over 18, we also added in a part to speak about employment. This tool is typically used for children 6 to 18, but for consistency's sake, we used it for all of the children through the protocol. And the tool is broken up into two parts. 
the first part goes over a variety of questions that could be attributed to a particular disorder. And depending on how these answers are scored, I'll go through a supplement portion, which can then also help diagnose um, any disorders. Now, it's important to say that the case ads is just a snapshot. And a lot of times when they come in with certain diagnoses, it's because the providers have seen them at a particular point in time, acute distress, or sometimes they kind of meet the criteria just, and they're just shy of actually fulfilling the full criteria, but to get services in school or in the community, it's, it's helpful to have certain diagnoses. So I don't want to discredit anybody's diagnoses that they came in with, but when we went through, there was some variations in the boys that, um, the diagnoses that the boys came in with, and then the boys, what they left with. So the first um, diagnoses that we we saw frequently was ASD or Autism Spectrum Disorder. Previously, about 31% of the study or the boys came in with that diagnosis. And then after the case ads assessment, well actually this was the ADI and ADOS by the psychologist, only about 14% of the boys had that disorder. Tick disorder, you can see the rate actually went up a little bit from six to fifteen percent. ADHD was about the same. There wasn't too much discrepancy there. ODD went down a little bit, oppositional defiant disorder. We had about the same as far as mood disorders. Anxiety disorders went down a little bit, um, as, and all OCD went up a little bit. This graph shows the breakdown of boys that were diagnosed prenatally with those that were diagnosed postnatally. And again, emphasizing that the postnatally diagnosed son will not have an increased risk for the psychiatric illnesses, but oftentimes if they're prenatally diagnosed, they have a lot of services in, in place that can help kind of dim, son, diminish some of the difficulties. So autism spectrum disorder, that, went, that was down um, in the prenatally diagnosed group, as well as tick disorders. The ADHD was up a little bit in the prenatally diagnosed group. The oppositional defiant disorder, we actually didn't have any, and that just kind of goes to the awareness of kind of some of the behaviors and the, the families kind of accommodating and really working with the children and understanding what's going on. The anxiety disorder in the postnatally group, postnatally diagnosed group was up a little bit, and we didn't really see anything as far as the obsessive compulsive spectrum disorders. It's also important to mention that a lot of children that come into the study have comorbid, comorbid diagnoses. So they might come in with autism spectrum disorder and ADHD, or ADHD and oppositional defiant disorder. And so in a little bit, I'm gonna kind of dive into the different, the different diagnoses and how the children are diagnosed with those. So first I'll start with autism spectrum disorder and it's diagnosed as persistent deficits in social communication and social interactions across multiple contexts. It has restricted repetitive patterns of behavior, interest, or activities. These symptoms must have been present during an early de developmental period, and they must cause clinically significant impairment in social, occupational, or other areas of functioning. ASD in the XYY boys, a lot of the boys have social communication deficits. They have a lot of difficulty socializing with their peers. A lot of times the families would come in and say that, you know, they got along really well with the children that were much younger than them or the older adults in the community. And that kind of goes back to the IQ and the cognition. A lot of them had some repetitive behaviors, a lot of difficulty with change, which also kind of coincided with some of the oppositional behaviors that they were seeing. And then some of them had preoccupation with certain objects or subjects. And so that's kind of in line with the ASD diagnoses that some of them came in with. The ADHD, or Attentional Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, is a persistent pattern of inattention or hyperactivity, impulsivity that interferes with functioning or development. So you can have the inattentive type, which is failure to give close attention to detail, difficulty sustaining attention to task. They don't seem to listen when you're spoken to, so they're kind of daydreaming, or you walk into a room and start talking, but they don't recognize that you're speaking to them. They have difficulty following through on instructions because they're getting easily sidetracked. So you ask them to go upstairs and get something and then come back and do something else and they get stuck upstairs and they're doing something completely different. 
They might have difficulty organizing themselves as far as getting their stuff together for school or a sports activity, or they might avoid or dislike tasks that require a lot of sustained mental effort. So this can get into the homework and some homework problems or kind of avoiding any of the lengthy papers that they have to do for school. They can be forgetful in daily activities such as you know, chores or when they get older, paying their bills or keeping appointments. They can also have the hyperactive or impulsive type, which they have to have six or more of the, these symptoms. So fidgeting, pacing, difficulty staying seated for a long period of time when they're expected to, such as in school or at dinner. They might run around a lot, so you ask them to go to the kitchen to do something. Instead of walking, they're running. Um, they might have that internal feeling of restlessness as they get a little bit older. They just kind of say that they feel like they need to kind of move around. They might not be able to engage and play quietly, so they might be upstairs or downstairs, but you always know where your child is playing because they're just that loud even if they're playing by themselves. They might have trouble settling down because they are always on the go, and they might be very talkative. In school, some of the problems are they're blurting out answers, so instead of raising their hand, they're answering the question when somebody else raised their hand, or they have trouble playing with children their age because they always want to go first, or they have trouble waiting for their turn to come back around. This can also be seen while you're waiting in line at the grocery store, they kind of get a little impatient. Or they can be impulsive where they see something and they just go for it as opposed to looking around and seeing if there's anything that they kind of need to be careful about. You can also have the combined type, which would be, would be both the inattentive and hyperactive type. So these symptoms must be present before age 12 and present in two or more clinical or two or more settings, so in school and at home. At home, and during social activities, such as you know, playing with their friends or sports activities. And they must clearly interfere with their functioning. So a lot of the symptoms that we saw were the children with the inattentive type were difficult. They had difficulty engaging with others. They would often lose focus, and they had a lot of difficulty following multiple step instructions. The hyperactive or impulsive type, they had trouble sitting through meals. So these were you know, the parents that would kind of space out how they were going to prepare a meal because they knew that their child wouldn't be able to sit down for the full dinner. They were doing things before thinking, as I said before, or they were fidgety or restless. And again, the combined is having symptoms from both of the inattentive and hyperactive parts impairing their function. Tick disorder. So I also saw a lot of children that came in with tick disorder. So motor tics are uncontrollable muscle movements. So frequently blinking or moving their arms to the side, raising their eyebrows or kind of some movements with their mouths. A lot of parents actually notice this. And when I asked specifically about any of these symptoms, they were like, oh yes, I actually noticed that he did this. Um, and also a little bit about the tics. Since a lot of these boys have ADHD and they're on stimulants, stimulants can exacerbate tics. So, it has to be without any medication, but a lot of times family members noticed it more when they started any stimulant medications. Vocal tics can be uncontrollable noises, so clearing of the throat, sniffing or grunting, some, sometimes animal noises, and it's not just the child being silly, it's you know him, you pointing out that he's doing it and he realizes it and stops for a little bit, but then starts it and doesn't even realize that that's what he's doing. Both of these must be present before 18, but they cannot be present at the same time. If you have both a motor and vocal tic, even within that same year period, it's considered Tourette's disorder, and that's just motor and vocal tics together. And they cannot be caused by any other medical condition or substance, as I said, with the stimulant medications that can sometimes enhance the tics. The Frequent ones that I saw when speaking with families were the mouth movements or kind of some of that nose scrunching and sniffing, not because of a cold or anything like that. And sometimes that's when parents, when they're younger, they're like, oh, they have allergies or something like that. And they kind of attribute those symptoms to something else. And that's important to recognize as well. But if you kind of go in and they've been on medications and they're still having it, then it could potentially be a tic disorder. And some of the behavioral difficulties. So, there's oppositional behaviors, which sometimes can be difficult for families to deal with, and that's a lot of times why they start to go and, and seek help is because they're having so many troubles with tantrums or, you know, their children not getting along with other people, and then, you know, when they tell them something, they say no, and it's, you know, there's a, a blow up. 
and that's hard with any child. A lot of times you kind of have to figure out the cognitive level and that's important as well to think about these, these boys because some of them are not at the level in, that correlates with their age. So kind of getting your expectations aligned with what they're doing and kind of talking to them and, and again telling them kind of what goes ahead of time because it goes back to the difficulty with some of the change. So letting them know ahead of time and being, you know, as gentle as possible, which obviously is not always possible, um, but that can be important. The irritable mood was something that we saw a lot. It's important to understand what's causing the irritable mood. You know, are they irritable because they're sad? Are they irritable because they have a mood disorder? A lot of times in children, depression can be seen as irritability. Is it difficulty, is it due to difficulty with their peers? As I said before, a lot of times they have trouble socializing and when you're a young child, school is a big part of your life and so if you're not having good relationships with peers, it can kind of become troublesome and you might kind of have more of an irritable mood. And so if you can determine what's kind of causing that irritable mood, which can then sometimes lead to the tantrums because they're just so on edge the whole day because they're having a rough time at school, they're not able to follow along what's going on. They don't have the friends that they, the other friends or other kids in their schools have. And then they come home and you know, the parents are expecting them to do more schoolwork or whatever happens. A lot of times the tantrums can kind of go along with those behaviors. So it's important to kind of figure out what's going on to help intervene. So getting services in school, such as an IEP or social skills groups, they can kind of learn to communicate with their peers a little bit or get them into therapy. Uh, or medication if needed. So I kind of alluded to this earlier, um, the IEPs can be a very, very key piece um, in helping the boys that I've seen um, in school. And again, I said earlier, a lot of times they're diagnosed with a, 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 a psychiatric illness to help them get these, these um, educational um, uh, assistance in place. And because a lot of times XYY is not enough to get you an IEP. So education, as far as us helping educate practitioners and school systems so that they can understand the difficulties that these boys face. Speech therapy is also important. It can help the boys communicate better. It can help also with the social skills group. It helped them with their peer relations, with their family relations. And just in general, it can kind of help the boys get along better. So the next steps, we really want to try to understand the variability between the boys. Again, the prenatal diagnosis and the postnatal diagnosis, even, with, even when you break those apart, there's still a lot of variability. So what's causing that? And we can also look between the different aneuploidy groups to try to understand how the, that Y chromosome is really affecting their symptomatology. We want to understand kind of the specific symptoms that go into different um, diagnoses. So as you can see here, the red line is the average and the, anything to the right shows more difficulty with a specific symptom. So we have aggression, anxiety, and attentiveness. And these are all of, well, not all of the aneuploidy groups, but these are some of the aneuploidy groups that we've seen. And the XYY boys are highlighted in blue. And as you can see, they're kind of in line with the other aneuploidy groups. There's nothing that kind of glares at you as even with aggression. With some of the literature, you would think that their aggression scale would be farther to the right, showing that they're having a lot more difficulty, but it's really not. And so anything closer to that two or anything two and over means that only 5% of other children would have difficulty with that particular area. And we also want to understand how the brain is affecting behavior. So there are some cortical changes and we kind of want to understand how those changes are affecting the behavior. And you can see the highlighted areas mean, are, mean that there's changes in the cortical thickness. And we also want to understand how genes affect the brain and also affect behavior. And so again, we're still continuing to see boys with XYY now. Um, and for all of the people that have already participated, we're trying to kind of go through and analyze all the data to really get information out there so that when your son is diagnosed with XYY, you don't go onto the internet and find all of this troubling information. And a lot of times the 
parents were saying that you know the, even their pediatrician didn't know what was going on, so they would just give them, you know, something that they printed off online, which is not very helpful and can be very troubling. And again, I want to say that you know all of these children have variability, so there's not going to be that just because your boy has X Y Y means that he's going to have attentional problems or he's going to have aggressive behaviors or he's going to have autism. You know, it's variability. We would really want to understand how the extra chromosomes are affecting behavior and affecting everything else. But so through that research, we're really trying to get something that so when you go online, you can see X Y Y syndrome and this is everything that you can have, good and bad, because they do have strengths as well. And it's important to focus on those, especially with the children, so that they can you know feel good about themselves and and the parents as well, because as they were talking about earlier, the stigma. You know, do you want to tell people that your child has X, X Y, Y when they can go and Google it and they're going to find out that they're going to become, you know, a criminal when they get older or they're going to be aggressive or have conduct disorders because that's not, that's not true and it could happen with any child. So it's not like we want to, you know, focus on the X, Y, Y boys having those issues. But we're still seeing other X, Y, Y boys, but we're also trying to extend this approach to all of the X and Y variations so that we can kind of compare and contrast the, the differences in the boys and girls with the various um, chromosomal aneuploidies. And this is our team here. Um, Catherine and Ari actually have gone on, but um, the rest of the team here is who has been working diligently and trying to get information out and helping the families go through. And again, I'd like to say thank you to everybody because families coming in and supporting research is how we're able to get this information and really try to get it out to the families and other practitioners so that we don't have the stigma so that you guys can get the information that you need and the sort resources that you need without trying to go through all these hoops and changes because we found that that's a lot of the issues is that they just a lot of educate or a lot of practitioners just don't know about the syndrome and then once you know what do you do because a lot of these boys do need help and it's trying to find those avenues before it's so much of a problem. So a lot of the prevention is gonna come from educating people about children with chromosome aneuploidies. Does anybody have any questions? Well, I think in general, unfortunately, it's hard to find a child therapist. I mean, it's just that that's just kind of the nature of the game. So when you have somebody that has a specific thing that you're kind of helping, trying to help treat, it's hard to find something that also not only has a specialization of working with children, but also has a specialization of working with children with an aneuploidy. And so I think that the access group is a good you know, group to kind of see other families here to see if they have any recommendations. A lot of times, and Dr. Rosenhan, you can speak to this as well, a lot of times we try to go with other resources that we might know in the community, but there's not necessarily one list of providers that work specifically with aneuploidy groups. Also just saying try to not get discouraged because it's with therapy, it's a very, like you said, you had a recommendation for an awesome therapist, but your son calls him Dr. Weirdo. So having the best might not necessarily be what you need. You need to find somebody that has that really good cohesive kind of bond with your son, which is hard because a lot of, how old is your son? Yeah, so eight's kind of a difficult age to kind of engage sometimes with therapy. So looking for different therapy modalities can also be a way to kind of go about it. If he has, you know, different things that you're working on, maybe try a cognitive therapist versus a play therapist versus art therapy. So you don't necessarily have to go to a therapist where he's talking because that might not be where he is right now.